Thank you. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 2776 in the name of Bill Kidd on the Jimmy Reid Foundation report Trident and its successor programme. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Will those members who wish to speak in the debate press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Bill Kidd to open the debate. Mr Kidd, seven minutes or thereabout, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, just before I start, uh, there's quite a lot in this debate, so I'm not going to touch on every single element, um, but I hope to bring forward a few um, interesting points which might not have been considered before, uh, as well as those which are, are reasonably well known. Um, but before I start, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to those in the public gallery, including representatives of Jimmy Reid Foundation, Scottish CND, Ban the Bomb, Medac Scotland, Navy Not Nuclear, and many others who support, illustrates the high level of public engagement in this issue of nuclear disarmament. In November 2016, the document Trident and its successor programme was published by the Jimmy Reid Foundation and was launched here in the Scottish Parliament. And today we welcome the findings of this report by bringing them into the Scottish political discourse. And may I also take this opportunity to emphasise how we in the Scottish Parliament are not alone in re-examining the nuclear debate. Last year, I attended the UN General Assembly debate on holding a special conference this year to analyse the case for nuclear weapons to be banned on the grounds of humanitarian concerns and the evidenced suffering by populations. This will result in a vote on a treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons. And it should be noted that the vote which has established this conference to take place this year was passed by 126 nations, four to 38 against with 16 abstentions. <clears throat> Confidence is high that there will therefore be an historic decision taking place this July, which will validate the points raised by the Jimmy Reid Foundation document. And I believe that the well-researched findings of the Jimmy Reid Foundation um, have been affirmed by international discussion at the United Nations and in the International Red Cross in responding to the tangible and very serious dangers of hosting and transporting within your country nuclear weapons. And I would argue that any continuance of the nuclear weapons programmes in Scotland, particularly those which are vulnerable to misfire and or error, is to undermine the basic function of governance, that is, the safety of those within a state's borders. The findings from the Jimmy Reid Foundation show that not only is there a redundant case for Trident renewal due to moral and philosophical considerations, but also due to their indiscriminate nature. Further, that the economic and job-oriented uh, justifications for Trident renewal have been proven to be maybe wishful thinking is a nice way of putting it, according to the report, which states that fewer than 600 civilian jobs are directly dependent on the existing Trident system at Her Majesty's naval base Clyde, which figures are actually sourced from the MOD through the Westminster Parliament. The evidence submitted by the Jimmy Reid Foundation is highly corroborated by the findings of UN House, UNA Scotland, UNA Edinburgh and the respected Acronym Institute through their draft report, the International Conference on Humanitarian and Environmental Impacts and Responsibilities of Hosting Nuclear Weapons. This highlighted that since the two bombs were dropped in Japan at the end of the Second World War, two and a half million survivors have sought treatment by the Japan Red Cross Society run hospitals. These hospitals exist purely for those still suffering from the effects of weapons dropped over 70 years ago. As recently as 2015, 11,000 patients were treated. Their findings also show that DNA damage has been evidenced by the number of children uh, survivors suffering from cancer who are now at least middle-aged and in many cases elderly. Right, I'm going to go off slightly a wee tangent here, if you don't mind, um, because at this point, I would like to mention the situation of a friend of mine from Kazakhstan. His name is Karabek Kayukov, who is a famous artist in Central Asia, though he has to hold a paintbrush between his teeth 
or between his toes. Because in common with one and a half million people in his homeland, Karabek was born with genetic damage through what is called acute radiation syndrome. This was caused by nuclear tests carried out by the Soviet Union in his home area. And Karabek was born of restricted height and he is completely without arms, hands or fingers. He's also an anti-nuclear uh, weapons spokesperson back home and in that role um, he was invited here to the Scottish Parliament two years ago um, but he was refused a visa to enter the UK as he could not supply fingerprints to go with his passport identification. However, the human spirit is undimmed and Karabek Kayukov sends his very best wishes for our de deliberations here today and to all of the Scottish people. So what about us here today? What, what about us? Well, we're not immune to radiation ourselves, nor do we have a level of moral superiority, which means that we should be trusted with weapons of mass destruction where all others are seen as rogues. Some of them are rogues, there's no doubt about that. And there's no doubt about the fact that they might acquire nuclear weapons because we've got them. They exist in the world. And that makes the world a more dangerous place, not a safer one. Real human security is for all peoples and it can't be maintained by the threat of annihilation of entire populations. And anyway, this is a small world and nuclear radiation cannot be contained within space and time. So regarding the risk posed by accidental or potential terrorist incident along the three times a year nuclear convoy route, not only to Scottish residents, but to many others in the UK, particularly those who live in the Birmingham, Preston, Weatherby and Newcastle areas where the convoys also pass through. Even without malice aforethought, plutonium and other radioactive materials can leak from warheads and contaminate communities, greatly increasing cancer risks and causing major long-term environmental damage. Evidence suggests in extreme cases, accidents could trigger a nuclear reaction. This is known as inadvertent yield and would deliver lethal radiation doses. Moreover, according to the MOD's own internal safety watchdog report, a terrorist attack could cause considerable loss of life and severe disruption both to the British people's way of life and to UK's ability to function effectively as a sovereign state. This consideration falls in line with the evidence of the larger impact of what the humanitarian impact would be if weapons were detonated in the case of war. 100 nuclear weapons in the whole area of Southeast Asia, for example, and this is a projection that was done by the International Red Cross, a projected 20 million people would die within the first week. And if you consider that's 100 nuclear weapon warheads, there are 240 warheads in the Trident fleet. Now I'm going to end with this. The very fact that the Jimmy Reid Foundation report has prompted this debate shows that we can still hope that we can look to this year's UN conference with belief. That we're not helpless in the, fate, in the face of nuclear state obliteration because we all must take responsibility for our own actions and also take responsibility for the actions of our elected representatives. We sit here as elected representatives and we represent the people who could be affected by these nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Kidd. I have 12 members wishing to speak in this debate, so due to that large number, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Mr. Kidd, would you be minded to move it? Yes, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Sir, I absolutely concur with this debate being extended as long as necessary, and as I do for most members' business debates. However, on a point of principle on this, yesterday I moved a similar motion and was told that the, I was told that the timings had been agreed by business managers. This is not about this debate. This is about the point of principle. Why is it? Can I, can can I just hold my no, point? Please sit down a minute. Uh, can I say that due to what happened, one of the explanations is, and I, I can see the point here, that when business managers agree the time for a debate, 
there won't be all the amendments in that sometimes come in later. So the, the, I understand that what's going to take place is there'll be a discussion with business managers that when a lot of amendments come into an important debate, therefore making times tighter, that there's a further discussion on timings for debate. But had that been extended yesterday, it would have meant moving decision time, it would have meant a five-minute adjournment, a vote, and so on, which we all have eaten into the debate. But I, I agree that there's an issue here, but as business managers had agreed it for, on behalf of their parties with an equal say, I think it's worth revisiting. I think I can understand in the chamber there's a desire to look at this. And as I say, when there's a lot of amendments, it changes, it changes the timings for the debate. So it will be looked at, okay? Um, that's taken a little bit, but not a lot of time. So I now move to the open debate, and I'm afraid it is speeches of four minutes. I take Rona Mackay to be followed by Jackson. Carla, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, can I thank Bill Kidd for bringing forward this member's debate and the Jimmy Reid Foundation and authors of the report for their hard work in putting the case for the non-renewal of this obscene weapon on Scotland's shores. This report shows the real impact that the Trident Successor Programme will have in Scotland. It destroys Labour and Jackie Bailey's claim that not new, renewing Trident will cost thousands of jobs. In reality, 600 civilian jobs are dependent at Fastlane and Coolport, with the Successor Programme failing to bring even a single new job to the base. Of course, these 600 jobs are vital to the community. But without renewal, there will still be work at the basis for civilian workers for the next 12 to 15 years. By that time, half of these workers will have reached retirement age, have benefited from redeployment or voluntary exit from the sector. Renewing Trident will also have major knock-on consequences for Clyde shipbuilding, with renewal costs meaning fewer orders of new Type 26 frigates. Presiding officer, scrapping Trident renewal is not a risk to jobs, but the astronomical cost of Trident, £200 billion, is costing jobs. We all know this money could be spent far more productively. It could be used to counteract the continuing decline in armed forces expenditure, decline that creates job losses, not just in the Clyde, but across the country. But, presiding officer, there's far more to this argument than pound notes. The recent Trident misfire and subsequent cover-up demonstrates the huge risk that these war machines present to us all. And if these weapons weren't risky enough, we cannot forget that the man who has control over this weapon on our land is President Trump. Can anyone say, hand on heart, that this prospect doesn't terrify them? Then there are the warheads transported by road, travelling through Scotland's most populated city. The Scottish Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament estimate that an accident on these convoys could lead to plutonium and uranium spreading across distances as vast as 17 kilometres, covering most of Glasgow and outlying areas such as my constituency in eastern Bartonshire. The risk that these convoys pose to human life is simply unacceptable and cannot be allowed to continue. The Clyde Naval Base was chosen to be home to the UK's nuclear submarines due to the depth of the Gerlach. However, that body of water is nowhere near as deep as the splits on Trident within the Labour Party. Labour's position in Trident has become farcical. With a leader in Scotland in favour of nuclear weapons but opposing them and a UK leader opposed to them but leading a party that supports the renewal. Confused? I certainly am. Uh, no, I'm almost finished, thank you. Presiding officer, I believe our government has a mandate to get rid of Trident. The SNP have been elected for a historic third term and in every one of our manifestos we have said we do not support Trident. Now is the time for us to start making plans about how we can do this. We cannot wait for permission we will never get from the UK government. We have to go ahead and rid our country of this obscene political weapon. We're the only party that can and will do this. We owe it to our children to support bairns, not bombs. I support this motion. Thank you very much. I call Jackson Carlo, who followed by Gil Patterson. Mr Carlo, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by um, commenting on uh, Bill Kidd, who is the proposer of this motion? And so I say that Bill Kidd has now brought forward several debates on this subject over a number of parliaments. And I suppose the obvious knee-jerk reaction sometimes from a Conservative to those who bring forward these issues, particularly those who sometimes have a kind of schoolboy crush with unilateralism, is to initially and immediately dismiss them. And I don't do that with Mr Kidd because I have come to find him an extremely genuine, articulate, measured 
and from the perspective of the argument he makes, a convincing proponent of the cause that he promotes. I just have come to a different conclusion to him, but I do not in any sense uh, dismiss the argument he makes or the compassion with which he makes it, because I think in the way that he articulates it, he demonstrates that he understands the nuance, the, the, the people who are involved in the ultimate consequence of anything that might arise from nuclear conflict. And I believe that is what genuinely motivates him in the repeated way in which he ensures that this issue is raised in the Scottish Parliament. So I want to make that absolutely clear as, as I go forward from that point. My own journey in this issue is different. I'm a child of the late 1950s, born not long after the war, as other members in the chamber will be too, who still have come to different conclusions to me. Um, I was vaguely aware and then understood the whole Cuban Missile Crisis in the 60s, the, the kind of international heightened tension that arose over the Vietnam conflict and the geopolitical maneuvering of the huge world superpowers. I understood the consequences of the Berlin airlift. I, I was in Berlin in 1983. I saw, as others probably did during that Cold War period, the reality of the standoff between East and West. It scared me. I was part of a generation who at school participated in a cadet force who grew up believing that I might actually have to fight a war. And I don't believe that is something now with conscription and all the international geopolitical conflict. I don't believe that is something my children have to consider as a realistic and immediate prospect, as I believe I did as I grew up. When the Berlin Wall fell, I actually flirted with the idea, was any of this any longer necessary? And I did so because, and I've come to the view that I still believe in the, the nuclear deterrent, because I have to say that in all the years leading up, almost to the day the Berlin Wall, wall fell, I never imagined it was a genuine possibility. I couldn't have predicted it. I didn't anticipate such a huge change in the geopolitical balance of power in the world. And I didn't really foresee, when I sat there in 1989, the whole different way in which the world has evolved and threats have emerged. And so I can't, with any certainty today, look forward another 30 or 40 years and predict what the existential threats might be to peace and security and to the, this island and the peoples on it. And for those reasons, I've come to the view that we should have a proportionate nuclear deterrent retained as part of our defence capability. As a country, we have significantly reduced our reliance upon it in terms of the warheads we have. The actual cost per person is something like, I don't know, I think it's like 20p in every 100 pounds that will be spent on defence over the next 30 or 40 years. I recognise that there are others who fundamentally disagree with me on this position. And I also recognise that when this issue most recently came up in the House of Commons, it was overwhelmingly supported there by some 400 and something votes to 117. I don't know if that will always be my view. I hope and I believe that, and wish to believe that we will live in a safer world where I might ultimately be able to come to a different conclusion. As I say, I've not held to that position blindly. I've tried to assess the evidence and have retained my position with it. And for those reasons, much as I respect Mr. Kidd, I can't support the argument ultimately and believe we must retain our independent deterrent. Thank you, Mr. Carlo. I call Gil Patterson, be followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, many thanks, uh, Presiding Officer. And I, can I start by thanking Bill Kidd uh, for bringing this debate and not forgetting that he has been honoured by folk respecting his views on these matters and as a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm a, it's just a pity that he didn't actually get that uh, prize. Uh, so thanks uh, again, Bill, for that. Once again, we stand in this chamber making the case against nuclear weapons of mass destruction. I'm sure we, we will all agree, for the sake of our small planet, that we must find a way to disarm. What these weapons of mass destruction are designed to do is almost unimaginable to us all. Bombs that we have built to reduce cities to ashes, a mis missile designed to fly thousands of miles, then split into 12 individual warheads, each bomb containing enough destructive power to destroy all life in its target and beyond. At supersonic speeds, they tear through the sky in a trail of fire. Scientists call this wicked sight the fingers of God. It does seem more like these people are trying to play God. The madness of the Trident nuclear missile program 
is beyond comprehension. It's for that reason I don't believe nuclear bombs will ever be used again. It would be mutually assured destruction. But what invokes horror in me is a potential for human error. Just last month, we were told of how a Trident missile malfunctioned, a miscalculation caused by human engineers. History is littered with the mistakes of mankind when arrogance overtook rationality, when ignorance eclipsed sanity. We should not be, be arrogant to presume nuclear weapons will end well. It is unwise to suppose we can, we can contend with such unimaginable forces. Just a few miles from my constituency, a vast underground arsenal of nuclear warheads is stored. In the event of human error, the consequences could be cataclysmic. My constituency of Clyde Bank Mogai would be utterly eradicated in the event of a detonation, along with the whole of the central belt, all the way through to Edinburgh. The aftermath in such an event would wipe out almost the entire Scottish nation, since we're centrally built, by and large. It might seem ludicrous standing here in the Scottish Parliament talking about a nuclear holocaust in Clydebank and beyond. But the notion of a thousand bomber raids over Clyde Bank also, also seemed eccentric before World War II. If there were to be a radiation leak when these weapons are being driven through my constituency, thousands of people could be exposed to it. It would be untold misery. The point I am trying to make is simply this. Human error is in, 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 inevitable someplace in this regard. It's just a matter of time. We must surrender these weapons before it's too late. All sides need to strive for nuclear disarmament for the sake of our small planet. Scotland must make its voice heard. We are a nation known for our resistance to the British state's nuclear program. A forward-looking and conscientious people who, direct, who reject these immoral weapons. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Paul Jackie Bailey, to be followed by Mary Evans. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I want to start by thanking Bill Kidd for bringing this debate to the Chamber and for giving me an opportunity to talk about the interests of workers in my constituency. Let me say at the outset that I respect those that believe in unilateral nuclear disarmament. I take a different view and believe that we should negotiate to rid the world of nuclear weapons on a multilateral basis. I want to achieve global zero. But whatever your point of view, we need to take responsibility for those employed at Faslane. Here are the facts about employment at Faslane and Coolport. A Freedom of Information response from the Ministry of Defence in September 2014 revealed that, the, that there are 6,800 people directly employed at the base between the MOD and Babcocks. A Scottish Enterprise Study commissioned from ECOS identified an extra 4,500 jobs in the supply chain and the local economy. That's 11,300 people. And due to a decision taken when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister to make Faslane the home of the UK's whole submarine fleet, we expect around 2,000 more jobs in the next couple of years. So we are approaching 13,000 jobs in total. Not 600 jobs, as the report would have you believe. And I would invite people genuinely to stand at the gates of Faslane at 7 a.m. in the morning to see the cars and buses queuing at the north and south gate as thousands go to work. And that's just the morning shift. Faslane is the biggest single site employer in Scotland, providing highly skilled, well-paid jobs, accounting for more than a quarter of the full-time workforce in Western Bartonshire. And when we speak about renewing Trident, let's also remember that what we're referring to is the new fleet of submarines and all of the jobs associated with their construction, maintenance and support. Thousands of workers at Barrow depend on Trident too. And the reason we have a naval base in my constituency is because of Trident. It would serve no strategic purpose without that. Let me share with you the observation made by Derek Torrey, who's the trade union convener at Faslane and Coolport, because I believe it was instructive. 
In response to the report, he said, and I quote, it's like asking how many people at Glasgow Airport directly rely on planes landing or taking off for their jobs, and then answering, it's only the people who drive the tractors to move planes to the runway or the people who wave them in with their lollipops. In reality, of course, without planes, there would be no airport. It's exactly the same at Her Majesty's Naval Base Clyde. No submarines equals no base and no jobs. And according to GMB Scotland, the jobs... I don't have time, I'm sorry. According to GMB Scotland, the jobs impact extends to 200 to 300 workers at BAE Systems on the Clyde, who will be redeployed to Barrow to work on the new submarines whilst waiting for the Type 26s to ramp up. And let's not forget the workers at Recyth working on the successor programme. Let me conclude, Presiding Officer, by touching on defence diversification. You know, we had a defence diversification agency set up by a Labour government in the late 1990s. It unfortunately failed to produce anything of note. But here is what others had to say about it. Unite the Union, in their Executive Council statement on 17th of July 2016, said defence diversification was, and I quote, a pig in a poke. GMB Scotland called on politicians to stop playing fast and loose with highly skilled jobs. Not my words, presiding officer, but the words of people that have deep knowledge of the defence industry. We should listen to them. And whether you are a unilateralist or a multilateralist, please don't pay lip service to workers in my constituency about jobs. Don't pretend and tell them that the number of jobs affected is smaller, because they know what the truth is. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. I call Mary Evans to be followed by Alison Johnson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And again, I'd like to thank Bill Kidd for bringing this motion to the Parliament and for giving us the chance to debate this subject, uh, as well as for all the work he's done in campaigning for nuclear disarmament. Um, I'd also like to start by welcoming the report from the Jimmy Reid Foundation, which I do think perfectly encapsulates and answers the case against Trident Renewal. Nuclear weapons are abhorrent and they're indiscriminate. And the fact is that there is no justification for their use. In 1945, when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it led to the death of an estimated 246,000 people, and the majority of those killed were civilians. The nuclear weapons sitting around the world today, including at Faslane, are up to 3,000 times the power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, and that has the power to completely incapacitate Scotland if anything, anything ever went wrong at Faslane, which, as we all now know, it very nearly did. The coordinator of the Peace Pledge Union said, the prospect of death and destruction caused by accident is no less terrifying than the thought of it being caused deliberately, and I would entirely agree. Morally, we simply cannot support the renewal of these weapons of mass destruction, and nor should we be forced into accepting them on our very own doorstep. From the storage, to the testing, to the transporting of the weapons and their waste, all of this puts Scotland at risk on a day-to-day -day basis, and all of this, by accident or design, if anything went wrong, would have an absolutely catastrophic effect on our country. When we look at the economic case against Trident Renewal, the campaign for nuclear disarmament currently places Trident Renewal at a colossal £205 billion. Even best-case scenario figures from an estimate from the chairman of the Common Foreign Affairs Committee, Crispin Blunt, puts the figure at £179 billion. This time last week, uh, in here in this chamber, Sandra White led a debate on women's, women against state pension inequality, a campaign for those women born in the 1950s who have effectively been shortchanged by the acceleration of the Pensions Act timetable. Is Westminster making any funds available to address the serious inequality here? Towards the end of last year, I took part in a debate on social security, and across this chamber came account after account from MSPs of constituents suffering at the hands of Tory-imposed austerity. People forced into starvation and illness because of sanctions. People with disabilities having their money reduced. We heard from agency after agency telling us about the effect that austerity and cuts to benefits and welfare were having on their members. Reports of people becoming increasingly ill, isolated and suicidal. We've seen the prol proliferation of food banks across our country. We suffer from food poverty. An estimated 22% of children living in Scotland live in poverty. I think that that £205 billion could be better spent. 
And not only could it be better spent in these areas, it could also be spent and invested in the industries that have a real future in Scotland and where, Minster, where, where Westminster has also seen fit to cut funding for carbon capture storage, our renewables industry. What infuriates me most is that when it comes to war and weaponry, money is never an issue and can always be found. Yet when it comes to the poorest and most vulnerable in our society, we're told of the dire straits of our economy and there's never any budget to be found. There is no such thing as a nuclear deterrent. Nuclear weapons have not stopped terrorist attacks here or elsewhere in the world. Nuclear weapons have not prevented the starting of wars or helped to end them. And there's the whole hypocrisy. How could the UK be so hypocritical as to have nuclear weapons, yet criticise and rally against others looking to have them? It's just a preposterous situation. The whole Trident renewal process and absolutely colossal expense that goes with it is simply to gratify the UK's, actually the Westminster government's superiority complex. It's a dangerous vanity project which needs to be scrapped. Thank you. I call um, Alison Johnson to be followed by Maurice Corrie, please. Alison Johnson, um, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too would like to begin by congratulating Bill Kidd, thanking him for bringing this debate to the Chamber this evening and also thanking him for his consistent and principled stance and all the work he does in this area. I was pleased to take part in November's launch of the Reid Foundation report, Trident and its successor programme, and grateful to the authors Mike Danson, Karen Gilmer and Jeff Whittam for making such a clear, well-researched and well-argued case for non-renewal, employment diversification and our contribution to peace. Parliament has previously voted with the Greens for a constitutional ban on Trident and a global ban on nuclear weapons, and I know that there exists a majority of members who believe that even if Trident were cost-free, if there was no charge, we should continue to demand its end and removal because it is an abomination to even consider using such weapons of indiscriminate slaughter and destruction. While I appreciate Jackson Carlaw's words, in my view, there is no proportionate nuclear deterrent. And for those who aren't convinced by what I and others see as the moral and philosophical case against renewal and who cite the economic benefits of spend, I cannot call this investment because the return on nuclear weapons is one that I never want to see. Let's be clear that Trident provides great benefits, but to whom? To banks, to arms suppliers and to multinational companies. The missiles themselves are American. And the report confirms that much of the hardware and software is reliant on imported technology. Trident Renewal offers little to the Scottish and UK economies in the way of economic and multiplier effects. And reports from Oxford Economics show that better economic outfit outcomes could be achieved by investing in social security or our food and drink sector, for example. And while the UK government has clearly decided to safeguard this specific area of defence, Many quality jobs in the public sector have been lost due to cuts and the impact on those employees, their families and communities is clear to see. And the impact on conventional defence forces too is clear. Former MOD personnel, including Lord Arbuthnot and Lord Brown, now oppose renewal. Trident destroys jobs elsewhere in Scotland and the UK and it prevents investment in the jobs of the future in a just transition to the sustainable low carbon jobs that we urgently need. Real security is about having jobs like these, having a home and having guaranteed clean drinking water. Along with the Reid Foundation and CND, the campaign against the arms trade produced valuable research and their 2014 report, Arms to Renewables, set out clear examples of how a diversification agenda would be of great benefit, creating such good quality secure jobs and utilising the skills that we really need in our new industries their research shows that offshore wind and marine energy could produce more jobs than the entire arms industry. CATS described their vision for a safer world as one which guarantees highly skilled manufacturing jobs that will be there in the future. And crucially, this is really important, creates the kind of future we might want to see, we might want to be part of. It is us that create the future that we're going to live in. And who's the we when it comes to discussing Trident in general? The moral and philosophical case presented by the Reid Foundation makes clear the democratic deficit involved in ignoring the overall position of the people in Scotland towards Trident. 
Presiding officer, the Reid Foundation's report was dedicated to Dr Alan McKinnon and John Ainsley, who campaigned tirelessly for nuclear disarmament before their passing in 2015 and 16, respectively. I'm proud to do anything in my power to carry forward their incredible work, along with colleagues in this parliament and the millions of people across the world who want to see governments pursue a radically different and more peaceful agenda. Thank you. Thank you. I call Morris Corrie, followed by George Adam, please. <coughs> Deputy, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd just like to thank Bill Kidd uh, for bringing this member's debate to the Chamber, and I fully appreciate his views, uh, most definitely. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, the only thing which stopped the world from slipping into a Third World War in the 20th century was the existence of opposing nuclear powers. France, the United Kingdom, and the United States on one side, and with the Soviet Union on the other. The ability to destroy one's enemy but only at the cost of destroying yourself, has proved to be the greatest reason against waging war upon your enemy. It, is, it was this which stopped the Cold War from turning hot. Now in the 21st century, we don't face the exact same challenges as those of the 20th century, but some similar old problems are raising their heads again. A resurgent Russia is pursuing an aggressive policy against its neighbors, whilst in the South China Sea, the Chinese are illegally gobbling up territory and rogue states continue to try constantly and get their hands on nuclear weapons so that they can threaten us and hold us to ransom. And, yes, sir. Mr. Secretary. Hey, can I thank uh, Maurice Corey for taking the intervention and just ask him, given that I think he's generally developing an argument in support of the possession of nuclear weapons, can he uh, tell us what the criteria that he would apply to which countries should be allowed to have nuclear weapons and which ones shouldn't? Maurice Corey. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, those who show proper control, and as you probably know, there is a monitoring force in place which is actually financed and supported by the major nations of this world and the major nuclear powers to ensure that the uh, safe keeping of nuclear warheads are properly guarded uh, around the various um, uh, Soviet, ex Soviet Union states. Yes? Neil Finlay. I, I, I'm presuming under proper control, that means ones that, when you press the button, go in the correct direction. <laughs> Mr Corey. Everything Mr Finlay has to be tested. Sometimes a test proves a, a need to change a mechanism or whatever, but you cannot have total 100% perfection on that, and obviously that is what happened in that case. And obviously it did self-destruct, that was what it's supposed to do, and it did it perfectly. No, I must continue. And with the 17,000 nuclear weapons in the world, no one in this chamber can know what threats will continue to emerge in the coming decades. I was fortunate enough when I was serving in the Balkans, in particular in Bosnia, I was liaising with the Russian brigade. And I was given some very good advice from my Russian army opposite number. He told me, do not drop your guard. You never know who will be in charge in my country here in Russia. We admire your strong strategic nuclear defense force. Do not drop your guard. I would advise, uh, dear members here, advice not to be ignored. <coughs> yes. Tom Arthur. Uh, when you spoke earlier, you were articulating the case of the balance of terror, but that was predicated upon rational state actors. Did you consider the heads of state for each of the P5 members as rational actors in the present day? Mr. Corey. I, I would say I would take a certain judgment on that, but um, obviously, like the curate's egg, there are good parts and there are bad parts of it. Therefore, now is not the time for the United Kingdom to disarm and leave itself defenseless against the other nuclear nations or groups that could get nuclear weapons. With the cost of maintaining our nuclear deterrent running at only 6% of our defense budget and 0.1% of total government spending, the cost of running the nuclear deterrent is affordable and represents an important and sensible investment in our future national security. That is not, to be, not, there's not even to mention the benefits of the West Scotland region, which I represent. Our nuclear deterrent is securing thousands of jobs at Fast Lane. It is now one of the largest employer sites, uh, not just in the West, but in the entirety of Scotland. With the entire fleet of submarines to be based out of Fast Lane in the future, the number of jobs sustained is going to go up from the current 6,800 personnel employed uh, at the base to over 8,200 by 2022. But bear in mind this, Her Majesty's Naval Base Clyde is the real peace camp, not the camp on the A814. 
This brings with it a significant economic benefit to local communities surrounding Fast Lane. This doesn't even include the thousands of jobs that are sized and on the Clyde that will be protected thanks to the construction projects of the successor submarine programme. GMB Scotland has estimated that up to 40,000 jobs in Scotland are dependent on Trident, and that is a lot of people employed. And the GMB Scotland Secretary Gary Smith was right to say that the 40,000 defence workers in Scotland are as vital to our national security as the armed forces. Without the skills of the workforce in the yards on the Clyde and Resyth, the Royal Navy could not defend the nation. For almost 50 years now, the United Kingdom has been kept safe thanks to the current fleet of Vanguard submarines patrolling and maintaining our nuclear deterrent 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 360 days a year. Their four replacements, now named the Dreadnought class, will ensure that protection remains in place until the 2060s. And it is vital that our national interests and security, the interests of our allies abroad, the safety of citizens, and also for the thousands of, of people in Scotland whose jobs depend on our nuclear deterrent, that we keep our nuclear deterrent in this in uncertain world in which we live. That is and why Scotland must, must remain I'm, part I'm sorry, of the United Kingdom. That's where you must stop. You're, we're going to keep it, is your right, argument. Okay. That's I'm just going to say we must remain a, part of the United no, Kingdom. No, you have to stop. I've given you extra time for interventions. Right, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'm now going to call George Adam, followed by Elaine Smith. George Adam, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And as after the previous contribution, where do I start, Presiding Officer? Well, I think I'll start by thanking my colleague Bill Kidd for bringing this debate to the chamber, uh, chamber because I'm pleased to speak on this subject because it's one of the issues that actually is the reason why I got involved in politics. It's, uh, I've been involved so long that I remember the debate on Trident as a replacement for Polaris. I disagreed with nuclear weapons then, as I do now. My old dad went to his first ever demo at Fast Lane at the age of 63. He came to the conclusion that there's no place in our world for these weapons of mass destruction. So if an old guy like my old dad can make his, change his mind and he, as a pensioner, I'm quite sure there's others that can see the light in this argument as well. And the Jimmy Reid Foundation report certainly presents the case for non-renewal of Trident and its replacement by the successor programme very effectively. The report is clearly set out in three sections explaining the moral case, the economic case, and the defence case for non-renewal. In each of these areas, the report clearly states, in no uncertain terms, how renewal will negatively impact the people of our country, specifically those living in and around the west of Scotland. Renewing Trident and the continuing to fire hundreds of billions of pounds into something we all hope we'll never use at the cost of funding for projects that will benefit the community, the environment and Scotland's economy seems bizarre to me. In Paisley, for example, local families and businesses are struggling, yet Westminster thinks it's OK to spend £205 billion on weapons that will undoubtedly only affect the very civilians we claim we're trying to protect. This doesn't make sense. The moral implications of a successor programme are extreme. The existence of nuclear weapons threatens the whole of civilization. Unlike conventional warfare, a nuclear attack does not discriminate between hostile aggressors or innocent civilians. Or in the speak of the President of the White House, the good guys are the bad guys. This is a direct contradiction to the principles of what is known in some circles as a just war. How can we support the destruction of thousands of innocent people if we ever had to use these weapons? The response to this would no doubt be, put, uh, put, be that the order for nuclear attack would never be given, which brings me to the question, the sense in spending a fortune in something that will never be used, while families are struggling financially throughout our communities. Deterrence is a rationale used by those in support of nuclear weapons, yet the report all, almost humorously renders this argument useless. Instead of creating fear and uncertainty, the non-renewal of Trident would free up massive amounts of money for public sector jobs, education, health care, conventional defence strategies. The list, presiding officer, goes on. In Paisley and Renfrewshire alone, even I can't imagine the financial benefits to my constituents. To me, the issue of Trident is simple. While Westminster covers up missile test failures, costing up to £17 million each, collisions in the Atlantic and breaches in fuel cladding, the fallout from a Tory hard Brexit will undoubtedly hit the poorest in my community the hardest. Given the sticky situation the people of Scotland are already in because of something we did not vote for, how can we support the successor programme? Again, something that the people of Scotland on numerous occasions say they do not want. 
The reported £205 billion pounds it will take to replace Trident would cost every UK taxpayer £3,000 a year. It would cost my constituency of Paisley alone £242 million. £242 million, pounds, presiding officer. Think of what that money could do for Paisley. Think of what that money could do for your constituency. And instead of investing in nuclear weapons, I, for one, would rather invest in the people of Scotland. Thank you very much, Mr Adam. I call Elaine Smith to be followed by Tom Arthur. Ms Smith, please. Thank you very much, President Officer, for calling me to speak to commend the report produced by the Jimmy Reid Foundation and to congratulate Bill Kidd, not only on securing the debate, but also for his tireless campaigning on the issue and his approach to building a cross-party coalition on this matter. And can I say and be very clear at the beginning, Scottish Labour has a recently confirmed policy against Trident renewal. And I think that anyone who is genuinely anti-Trident would want to welcome that. There is an economic case and a defence case against renewal, but I believe we should always begin with the moral case, which is well summed up by the ex-Foreign Minister of Australia, Gareth Evans. The fact remains that the existence of nuclear weapons as a class of weapons threatens the whole of civilisation. This is not the case with respect to any class or classes of conventional weapons. It cannot be consistent with humanity to permit the existence of a weapon which threatens the very survival of humanity. So when you take away the smoke and mirrors and the patriotism and the difficult history that this has had in Scotland and the UK, I think it comes down to this. These missiles are designed to kill on an industrial scale. And that's wrong, it's repugnant, and it's immoral. And I don't believe that the answer, of course, is to simply remove them from Scotland to England. Whether those weapons are based at Fazley and Barrow or even in the US, it makes no difference. They're a terrifying threat wherever they are. And I also say to colleagues, it really is past time that the UK took seriously our obligations under the UN Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. We can't simply wait for Russia or the US to do it. We should be leading the way. President Officer, in November, I helped to host the initial announcement of this report by the Jimmy Reid Foundation here in Parliament. And the report sets out the cost of trying, we've heard this, the cost of getting rid of it economically and also personally for those who work with it and the lengthy history of resistance against it. And of course, there are some, and we've heard them, are saying that getting rid of Trident will be an attack on workers, a number of whom are highly skilled. And I understand that point, and I do have some sympathy with it. No one should lose their job due to Trident decommissioning, so we must make sure that that is part of any plan going forward. But as this report states, 600 civilian jobs are directly dependent on the existing Trident system at Fast Lane, and I think that in a civilised 21st century society like Scotland, we should be able to re redeploy 600 workers into suitable sectors, preferably in and around the existing base. And the remaining jobs at HMNB Clyde, according to this report, which is well researched, work on other submarines and surface ships, and those jobs are not at risk. The report, of course, also suggests setting up a Scottish Defence Diversification Agency, as proposed by the STUC, which will help to redeploy workers and integrate them into new roles. Indeed, Junison this week made the point that there should be more socially and economically productive work for some of our most skilled craftspeople than the upkeep of weapons of mass destruction. I think if people see um, that a plan is in place, then it is much easier to make the argument against renewal. And anyone who wants to come and debate that can do it after the debate with the authors of the report. The UK government estimates the renewal of Trident submarines will cost around £31 billion, but this report shows the lifetime cost of maintenance and staffing, etc., will be £205 billion. And for me, that is not a price worth paying for a deterrent that simply just makes us part of the International Bully Boy Club. And the, argument, the economic argument for scrapping Trident also seems fairly clear to me. Spending billions on renewing nuclear weapons is wrong at any time, but it's particularly wrong when vicious cuts are being unleashed in so many areas. President officer, reports like this only bolster my belief that Trident should not be replaced and my resolve to fight against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Storing our own weapons of mass destruction is wrong, replacing them is wrong, and using them would be not only wrong, but reckless, despicable and immoral. And I congratulate Mike Danson, Karen Gilmore and Geoff Wortham on the report and uh, our colleague, for bringing it, Bill Kidd, for bringing it to the Chamber this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Tom Arthur, to call by Edward Mountain. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to congratulate uh, Bill Kidd on securing this debate and thank the authors um, uh, of the Jimmy Reid Foundation for producing the report that stimulated this uh, debate. Um, 
I'll put on the record my opposition to this, uh, but there's been a lot of ground covered um, to, uh, this evening. And what I really want to do is uh, to focus my remarks um, on the question of uh, Trident's supposed independence. An assertion often made, but one which I would argue is uh, both ill-informed and misleading. Now, let us consider what independence in this context actually means. There are two aspects. Firstly, is the concept of operational independence, whereby the UK has the ability to patrol and launch the missiles. While a technically plausible claim, there are significant political complications, on which I will return to later in my remark. The second crucial question of Trident's independence is in its procurement and maintenance. Given that the missiles on British Trident submarines are part of a common pool of missiles shared with and maintained by the United States, it is understood that if the United States were to withdraw their cooperation completely, the UK nuclear capability would probably have a life expectancy measured in months rather than years. Not my words, presiding officer, but those of the Cross-Party Trident Commission, co-chaired by Sir Malcolm Rifkin, Sir Ming Campbell and Lord formerly Des Brown, two of whom are former UK Defence Secretaries. This situation means, in the words of Professor Colin Gray, as cited by the Cross-Party Commission, that the British nuclear deterrent is hostage to American goodwill, the dependency of which is critical. Writing in, 20, in 2014, the Commission stated that it might be difficult to imagine circumstances where the United States would cease to have a strong interest in the strategic survival of Europe, but went on to say, rather presently, that there was a doubt related to the possibility that isolationist tendencies that have always existed within the United States could strengthen again, adding that US interests are different from British or European ones. I'm sure that given recent developments in American politics, members will wish to reflect upon these serious points. Turning to the question of operational independence, there are two aspects, the technical operational independence and the political operational independence. While the technical aspects of operational independence are difficult to verify from information available in the public domain, I do believe that it is possible to say something about the question of the political independence, something already compromised by the complete lack of independence in procurement and maintenance. The power to authorise the launch of an armed Trident missile rests with the UK government. The most likely scenario in which such an authorisation would be given is as part of a US-led NATO strike against a nuclear armed state aggressor, where UK participation would not only be tokenistic, but strategically unnecessary. The UK does not impact upon the strategic balance, and it can be argued that resources would be better deployed from a NATO perspective on conventional forces such as anti-submarine warfare in the North Atlantic. The UK's membership of NATO also vitiates the argument of deterrence, given that the US is the effective nuclear guarantor of um, Article 5. The final argument adduced in favour of Trident is one described by the Cross-Party Commission as a future circumstance in which the UK faces a strategic threat where the extended US nuclear deterrent is under question, but in which the United States would not obstruct the UK exercising its independent operation. Presiding officer, such a situation is all but impossible to conceive, but there is a useful historic example to demonstrate how such a scenario could potentially play out. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy stated that it shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. In making that statement, Kennedy made clear that the Soviet Union would not be able to limit the theater of any nuclear exchange to North America and the Caribbean. Any launch from Cuba would not be regarded as an aggressive action solely from Cuba, but from the USSR. Now, were an aggressor nation to be faced with the threat of a unilateral nuclear strike from the UK, in the face of annihilation, they would have nothing to lose um, in stating that they would regard any such attack as an attack by NATO and the United States. The Cross-Party Commission notes, extended nuclear deterrence is inherently problematic, requiring the sponsor, in this case the United States, to risk their own city's destruction to protect an ally whose actions they may not agree with. If such a scenario were to transpire, it would be clear that the United States would do all we could to obstruct a unilateral British strike, making the pressure applied to the UK during the Suez Crisis pale in comparison. Presiding officer, unfortunately, time limits me, but I hope that in these remarks I have succeeded in convincing some members that it is simply not sustainable to describe the UK, UK's nuclear deterrent as independent. Thank you very much, Mr Arthur. I call Edward Mountain, followed by Neil Finlay. Mr Mountain, please. Sir, and I'd like to thank, to thank Bill Kidd for bringing this motion. I, I fear we'll come from it from different angles, but, but I am grateful for the chance to discuss it. My thought process on, on nuclear weapons goes back to when I was a soldier in the 1980s in the British Army of the Rhine. We were deployed out there to prevent the incursion of the Russian army. We were outnumbered six to one. 
In fact, the Russian third echelon troops alone outnumbered the entire force. Our job out there was to form a bridge to stop the Russians coming in and wait for air supply from the USA. We needed to delay them for five days. We had a plan, a plan based on the folder gap and holding the Russians there. Now, at that stage, our plan was to hold them, and the Russians knew that. They absolutely knew that. And their plan was to get us out of the way as quickly as possible. That's why we practiced in nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare, to be able to defend against anything that they threw at us. As horrific as it may seem, and I agree they're abhorrent, we had to be prepared because we knew that if we did hold them up and we delayed them for anything like four days, that the response was going to be nuclear weapons or chemical weapons to get rid of us. Now, we at that stage had approximately 560 nuclear weapons. That's the UK. They were based between battlefield nuclear weapons, which were lance missiles, tactical nuclear weapons, which were airborne missiles, and strategic deterrent in the form of submarines. Now, that's a lot of nuclear weapons. And it was frightening. It is frightening. It's a frightening thought to even go there. And I was delighted in 1990 when Boris Yeltsin came to power and it turned to be the end of the Cold War. And we started to knock back on the amount of nuclear weapons that there were. In fact, we knocked back so considerably, we dropped it back to 180 nuclear weapons that we hold. And when we get down to the successor program, we'll go down to 120. That's a 79% reduction on the amount of nuclear weapons that we've had. Now, there are no other countries in the world that have reduced nuclear weapons to that level. In fact, if anyone wanted to interrupt me, I would have taken an invention, intervention because there's one, Ukraine. Now, Ukraine did that on the over, being overseen by the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. And on the 5th of December, they, designed, they signed the Budapest Memorandum. Now, they agreed at that stage that they would give up unilaterally all their nuclear weapons and they would rely on the Soviet Union or the, uh, uh, and America to protect them. Now, that, as we know, didn't happen. Now, I just made to put these, these comments to you as a thought process. At the moment, our army of 82,000... No, I'm sorry, my time is so short. I may be just in a minute. Let me just see if I can develop this a bit more. Our army of 82,000 with an American army of 535,000 actually has less soldiers in the field than the North Korea does. In fact, North Korea has 1.7 million soldiers in arms and have 7.7 7 million soldiers in reserve. Chinese army has 28 million regulars and goodness knows how many reserves. I think just about all of them could become reserves. And the Russian army has, has 771,000 and 2 million reserves. Now, I think, therefore, it is right that we have an ultimate deterrent. And to me, the argument is not right on why we should, that we shouldn't have one. It's how we manage that deterrent. And for me, it's very important. And an argument that I would like to develop is whether we should have three or four boats. I personally believe three boats would be sufficient. And I believe that the running cost of four to five percent would actually, of the defence budget, is perfectly manageable. Now, I'm sorry, I, I am running out of time. I would just like to say, I don't believe that Trident is a dangerous weapon. I have guarded nuclear weapons, and I know the care that they have taken. And so, therefore, I support having nuclear weapons as a weapon of very last resort and the ultimate deterrent. And I believe we give it up would be extremely dangerous. Thank you. Thank you very officer. much. I call Neil Finlay to follow by Marie Todd. Marie Todd will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr uh, Finlay. President, I'd like to thank Bill Kidd for bringing this debate forward. He's a consistent campaigner and someone who seeks to build bridges on this issue. Can I say to Edward Mountain, the idea of a nuclear weapon that is not dangerous is a new and novel concept to me. But um, politics is about debating the big issues of the day and it's about discussing and hearing counter-arguments and attempting to influence people and winning them over to your position by the strength of that argument. And this is one of the big issues. For those of us who are opposed to Trident Renewal, that is our task in Parliament. We now have the Scottish Labour Party, the SNP, and the Green Party opposed to Trident Renewal. The political task for us now should be to convince others. I want the Liberals... Uh, to be on board. I, and as a socialist, I'm always an optimist. And I would urge the Tories to join us in opposition to Trident renewal. 
But I have to say to Rona Mackay, if she thinks that her speech is the way to build, uh, to bring people together and grow the coalition against Trident, I think she was maybe wants to reconsider. We don't build that coalition through moral indignation. The argument will be won when we're able to address defence, economic and other concerns head on, when we can reassure those who are worried, those who will be directly affected, whether they be workers on the Clyde, business owners around Fast Lane, or people fearful about the country's defences, once we, when we convince them that we have the answers to their fears. And those, those arguments are there to be taken on in one. The military argument grows weaker by the day. We now have ex-generals and field marshals like Lord Bramwell and General Ramsbottom say, saying that, change, uh, that the changes in international politics make Trident an irrelevance. Major General Patrick Cordenley. Certainly. Edward Mountain. Um, I, I very much take the fact that there are some uh, military uh, generals who, who might argue against it. None of the people that you are mentioning uh, have served and have been regular soldiers actually serving in the last five years. Have you got somebody in the last five years that would support your argument? Neil they, Finlay. These people have operated at the very highest level of the armed forces and we also have ex-secretary of defence secretaries coming on board of all parties coming on board. So I think there is a growing case uh, against, uh, and the military argument does grow weaker. Uh, Patrick Cordenley, who led the British Armed Forces in the first Gulf War, said strategic nuclear weapons have no military use. It would seem the government wishes to replace Trident simply to remain a nuclear power alongside the other four permanent members of the Security Council. This is misguided and flies in the face of public opinion. We have more to offer the nuclear bombs. And they identify cybercrime, climate change and terrorism as the main threats to our security. So it's in these issues that any defence investment should be focused. But, President Officer, for me, the jobs argument is one of the most important remaining arguments that we have to nail. Because in this debate, the workers and the communities affected by Trident are a key consideration. We want them to join us and, uh, 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 and the cause of disarmament. We have to give assurances to local supply chain companies, small businesses, engineers, technicians and fabricators that we have a real and genuine plan to create new jobs for every worker. Not imaginary jobs, but a guaranteed future. And I think with 205 billion, surely we can do that. It cannot beyond, be beyond the wit of women and man to use the, uh, that eye-watering sum of money for things that will benefit humanity, not if it was ever used, destroy it. According to SPICE, there are around 15,000 jobs across the UK associated with Trident, and the Reid Foundation paper says 11,000. These are a mix of direct supply uh, and local associated services. That means that every job costs between, I think they say, between 14 and 18 million pounds. That, as a job creation scheme, is not good value for money over a lifetime of a contract, I would suggest. And of course, this is for something that we hope never to use, because if we did, it would wipe out the human race. President Officer, I welcome the Reid Foundation's report as a contribution to the debate. I look forward to a world free of nuclear, biological and chem chemical weapons. I believe we all, all of us in here, want to live in peace and solidarity with our fellow human beings. Thank you very much. I call Marie Todd and I'll call the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Ms Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you too to Bill Kidd for bringing forward this important issue for members' debate. Times have changed since the Cold War. The UK Government's own national security strategy identifies terrorism, cyber warfare and natural disasters as the greatest threats to national security, not nuclear warfare. And yet the UK government still wants to renew Trident, knowing fine well it's outdated and ineffective in the face of these major threats to global security. In the 21st century, not only does Trident fail to enhance our security, it fundamentally undermines it. If the UK can argue that Trident's essential for its security, can other states not reach the same logical conclusion? The UK's refusal to give up Trident is a blatant disregard of the principles of non the Non-Proliferation Treaty, to which it is a signatory. 
There's clearly a strong moral and ethical case against nuclear weapons. Their use can never satisfy the principles of just war th theory because their disproportionate force and the indiscriminate targeting of civilians. And let's put this into perspective. The destructive power of one Trident missile is estimated to be the equivalent of eight Hiroshima's. And each of the UK's four nuclear submarines carry 16 Trident missiles. We know that Trident's both powerful and indiscriminate, and if it's used, it would kill millions of innocent men, women and children and affect the health of future generations to come. An issue we face in the Highlands is storing and transporting nuclear material, and it should be a lesson to all of us not to burden and endanger future generations with the decisions that we make today. Right now in the Highlands, we have American Air Force cargo planes transporting weapons-grade uranium from Dunray on the north coast to the US. This material came to Scotland for safe storage from behind the Iron Curtain at the end of the Cold War. Last year, David Cameron did a deal with President Obama, and now we're sending that material to Trump. Whilst many people in the constituency are very glad to see it go and not to have the burden of keeping it safe for the next 100,000 years, many have expressed concerns about the safety and security, particularly since the airport runway is too short for such a big plane to take off, so refuelling at a base in Murray is needed before that particular cargo crosses the Atlantic. The extraordinary cost of Trident diverts resources from other conventional defence. In Scotland, all of the investment is being stripped out, and with the closure of Fort George in the Highlands, we'll be left with no personnel. Sure, they'll visit us to use the bombing ranges, and the deeply unpopular nuclear submarine will still go up and down our coast, disrupting our fishermen. I want to make a couple of final points before I finish. Like Tom Arthur, I do wonder, is our independent nuclear deterrent really independent? The debacle of the recent failed test showed us that because of US government involvement, the people of the United States are better informed about Trident than we are. Polls have consistently shown that the majority of Scots oppose Trident, and the Scottish Parliament and most political parties in Scotland oppose Trident. There is a fundamental issue of democracy here. So in summary, Trident diverts resources. It's ineffective. It's immoral. It's dangerous. It's not independent. And we don't want it. Let's not have it. Thank you very much. I call on Keith Brown to close for the Government. Cabinet Secretary, seven minutes, please. Hey, thank you, President Officer. Uh, as ever in the Chamber, we've heard uh, informed and passionate debate against Trident, uh, as well as its successor programme, and indeed against all nuclear weapons. And I, like others, would commend Bill Kidd for again bringing this matter for debate to the Chamber and echo his words to those in the gallery um, who are here today and also who have been involved uh, in this report. And I think it is a report which effectively, very effectively, it demolishes the arguments made by Jackie Bailey in relation to the claims that she makes uh, for jobs dependent upon uh, this successor programme. And we've had something of a, a mini-max thing. On the one hand, we've had Jackson Carlow minimising, I believe, the cost of this by referring to it as being, I think, 20 pence in every hundred pounds, and then quietly adding in over the next 40 years. It's a hard way to try and describe 205 billion pounds and what that means to people and we've had the maximization uh, argument from Jackie Bailey in terms of the jobs not just in terms of the number of jobs but also in the idea that jobs are the argument she made one or two introductory comments about multilateralism which she usually does and then it was all about jobs there is no way on earth as Alison Johnson and others have said, you can justify expenditure of £205 billion for the number of jobs uh, which um, are said to be dependent upon it. But above all, as others have said, the main argument against this is that nuclear weapons are morally wrong. They're morally wrong for a number of reasons, but especially because of the indiscriminate nature of them. Uh, the fact that you cannot uh, launch 
uh, a strike with nuclear weapons and restrict that to those that you would see as being your enemy without uh, taking in huge numbers of civilian and often innocent populations. They are indiscriminate and absolutely devastating in their impacts. And uh, given that, uh, I think a very interesting point when I uh, asked um, Maurice Corey about what countries should be allowed to have them, he said uh, those which can exercise proper control. I'm sure if he thinks about this a bit longer, he will very quickly think of countries which could quite conceivably have proper control, whatever that means, of nuclear weapons, or whatever he means by it, of nuclear weapons, that he would not want to see anywhere near nuclear weapons. And the point I was trying to make is, how do you decide who is deserving, who is responsible enough to have nuclear weapons, and who is not? And I think if you can't do that, it's hypocritical to say, we can have them and others haven't, uh, can't have them. It's also the true truth that they are extremely expensive and also the consequences of that expense in terms of uh, uh, opportunities foregone. Many members have mentioned social programmes, but even if we restrict it to the military. I met this afternoon with senior military figures who were talking about the cuts uh, to defence services, cuts that we've seen over many, many years. We saw P-45s being handed out to soldiers in Afghanistan on active duty. Uh, also, soldiers in Afghanistan telling them that the regiments which they had joined up for, from, from Scotland were being abolished or merged. These are the effect of the cuts. These are the uh, opportunity cost, even if you just restrict it to the military, of expenditure on uh, Trident and nuclear weapons. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, as Neil Finlay said, so many serving personnel who have to be quite quiet about what they say, but uh, previous serving personnel and ex-senior political figures involved in defence have now said it is not worth the candle in many different ways. As you know, in June, July last year, the UK government voted in favour of the Trident Successor Programme, despite all but one Scottish MP voting against renewal. As members will also be aware, in January this year, the Sunday Times led with a story that there had been a misfire of a Trident test missile one month before that vote, which the UK government chose not to disclose. Now, there was a bit of a light-hearted exchange about uh, missiles going off in the wrong direction. Just think about the consequences. Had that had warheads on it and been fired in anger? Think about the consequences. That could have quite easily come back onto the very people that were seeking to deploy it against somebody else. That's an extremely... I will, I will take an interview. Edward Mountain. Sorry, I mean, I, I mean in fairness, uh, and, and, and I know you, you've got military experience it, it, exactly the same as, as me. All weapons at some stage will misfire. And the whole point is that you have fail safes. You have fail safes on any weapon apart from small arms, which can allow you to detonate uh, uh, the missile or, or to get rid of it. And in this case, it didn't have a nuclear weapon on top of it. it all it was doing was testing the missile system. Now, sometimes missiles go wrong. Would the cabinet accept that missiles sometimes do wrong, go wrong, and it's important to test them? Cabinet uh, Secretary. Of course, of course I accept that. There is a lengthy process for testing uh, weapons of all different descriptions. What I'm talking about is the consequences of it going... If you have a misfire uh, in an SA-80, then you've got a real damage to the person firing it. If you've got a misfire in relation to a Trident nuclear missile, the consequences are felt by hundreds of thousands or millions of people. So it is a question of the scale. Uh, these reports, I think, are deeply worrying. Uh, I will do. I, I, I suspect you have to, Cabinet Secretary. Ms McKelvey. <laughs> Thank you very much, President Officer and Cabinet Secretary, for taking the intervention. The issue about tests, and it's an issue that I have pursued in this place for 10 years with no numerous governments, whether they're Labour or Tory governments, is tests. When is this government going to abide by the rules, take responsibility and compensate the nuclear test veterans who were used as guinea pigs at Christmas Island? That's the result of tests where people are genetically modified and lose children and have all sorts of health conditions because of tests. No tests done without any real oversight. That's the people that this government, I, I think UK that's government, a long intervention, to Mr. take Kelby. responsibility for. Long intervention, not absolutely in point, but Cabinet Secretary. Yeah. I entirely agree with the last speaker, <laughs> presiding officer. These reports, though, of the tests which were not disclosed to Parliament, that's an important point, not disclosed. Uh, all previous missile tests were publicised by the MOD, and it's a serious concern that the information was not disclosed before the vote on Trident. The Secretary of State for Defence even now has refused to confirm or deny that such an incident took place. I don't know if he realises how foolish that makes him look, given that this is very available to people in the United States. 
uh, and he did not confirm that when called to account in the House of Commons. He has stated that we have absolute confidence in our independent nuclear deterrent. Well, I don't think that's the case, and I think it was a very good speech by Tom Arthur in relation to the putative independence of that uh, system. Uh, that uh, refusal to acknowledge the incident is unacceptable, and the Scottish Government calls for full disclosure uh, by the UK Government. There are various estimates, as we've heard, of the figures. £180 billion has been mentioned by Crispin Blunt, a Conservative MP, £205 billion by others. Uh, but replacing Trident will see billions of pounds wasted, money that could be better spent elsewhere. But one of the most compelling arguments is the argument made uh, by Marie Todd and others. What we have in this Parliament, we've had a number of votes over the last, I think, six years. This Parliament clearly expressing its opposition to the uh, basing of weapons in this country. We've also had 58, I think it was, or maybe 57 of the 59 MPs from Scotland voting against that. When you have that, that's a pretty explicit uh, expression of the will of the people of Scotland. But worse than that, it's the fact the weapons are based here. The weapons are actually based in this country and the consequences of a rogue missile, of a, of a test that goes wrong uh, if, if it happens in those circumstances, they're felt here. And actually to see that this week the MOD has said that they have looked at the issue of whether it should be based in Devonport and has ruled it out because it's not safe enough for the local population. What does that say to the people in West Central Scotland? Well, Jackson Carlos shakes his uh, head, but maybe he's got an answer. What does that say about the relative value put on the, the lives and the livelihood of people in West Central Scotland? Uh, specifically on the 7th of November, the MOD announced that we'd see a 20% reduction in the defence estate in Scotland. Those cuts will have far-reaching economic and social impacts. For example, as the report highlights, the removal, for example, of the, the army from Fort George, the Inverness, uh, see over 700 job losses, over a 200-year history of being located in that area, and approximately a £20 million loss of income to the local economy. The report also questions the impact... The uh, Cabinet said we'll have to close, I'm okay. afraid. Scotland, uh, in relation to the jobs, and it's, a bit, of course, as Neil Finlay and others have said, a very real uh, concern, although the report that's been produced does go in in some detail to the possibility of ensuring that those jobs can be safeguarded. And we do have a, a strong system of business support available through Scottish Enterprise and others to make sure that diversification could happen. Uh, finally, President, so I'd like to stress to the Chamber that the, the Royal Navy and their Armed Forces personnel have the full support of the Scottish Government, as we support all of our armed forces and their highly professional and skilled personnel. Our opposition remains to the possession, the threat, the use of a weapon system which is strategically and economically wrong and whose use would bring unspeakable humanitarian suffering and widespread environmental damage. The Scottish Government therefore continues its commitment to the safe and complete withdrawal of Trident from Scotland. We have repeatedly called upon the UK Government to cancel its plans for the renewal of Trident and we will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I thank all members for their contributions in the debate and I close this meeting.